Thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? If I have to bend over, I won't be able to stand up at the end of the talk. Can you hear me in the back? The problem is these microphones are too short. <laughs> I got a choice here. Is that better? Yes. All right, now I got to reorganize. So thank you for inviting me to talk. I had mentioned some ethical principles on a talk at the last conference in Orlando, and, and they had asked me to talk about ethics. And I think this is very important in, in, in the disease epidermolysis bullosa. Uh, the severity of this disease, the, the possibilities for new therapies, all these things are what really drove me to try to focus on ethics and ethical decisions. And I'll try to walk through some of the choices you as parents and families and patients will have and so that you understand in the future we have great opportunity to greatly improve and, and truly treat this disease and not just care for it. And, but, and you will be the people and your families will be the people involved in some of these trials and you need to have a good open idea on what that means. Uh, this picture is a picture of the central part of campus of Stanford. And when you think of Stanford, uh, you think of an area of education, but what this picture of, that central area, that's a church. Uh, this is a secular university, it has no religious denominations, and yet the center of this, this campus is a church. And often when you think of ethics, you think of morality. Uh, but let me walk you through ethics. So basically, ethics, fancy names, systematic endeavor to understand moral concept and justify moral principles and theories. It's a generic term for understanding the, examine the moral life. But in truth, ethics is what is the right thing to do. So each day you make decisions. What is the right thing to do? Uh, I thought this question about medical marijuana was an excellent, excellent topic. I mean, what is the right thing to do? How do we approach? How do we benefit our children? How do, how do we benefit these diseases? What do we do? Well, it turns out that clinical trials, clinical research, is over 2,600 years old. So the first reported trial in the literature uh, was documented in 406 before the Common Era, so 26, 206,000 years, 2,600 years ago. It was recorded in the Hebrew text Daniel. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar of ba Babylon had just captured Jerusalem. His idea was to pick the brightest, the youngest men who could be leaders for him in the future, bring them to Babylon, let them understand him, let them start to love him, and then send them back into to the uh, Jewish-Israelite community uh, to let them bond Babylon to, to Israel. But Daniel was one of these people, and he refused to eat the royal rations because the royal food was all blessed in the name of multiple other gods before they ate it. So he felt these foods were impure, so he asked the palace masters to allow him to do a clinical trial. Uh, his friends and he would only eat vegetables and drink water for 10 days. And at the 10 days, they would see how they did. And so this is a direct quote from Daniel. At the end of 10 days, it was observed that they appeared fatter, better, than all the young men who had been eating the royal rations. So the conclusion was the Israelite men were allowed to eat vegetables and water and avoid uh, the the foods that were offered to the other gods of the Babylonians, and the Israelite men received direct intervention from God and gave them knowledge and skill. Now, one of the things today in clinical trials, many patients may hope for an intervention from God, uh, but it's not gonna happen. And that's sort of the focus I'd like, I'd like to do on this talk. So research, by definition, is not done for benefit of the subject, it's done for benefit of society as a whole. And as we put our children into research trials and as we think about research trials, the focus that I'm gonna to try to talk about is how you really want that to help your child or your family, your member, you. Uh, but, the, but the research process itself is focused on society, not necessarily the individual. So there has to be integrity in scientific research. The things that we do as physicians, the things that, that people do as companies or whatever, they have certain integrity they have to do. And public funding is based upon the principle that public good is advanced by science conducted in the interest of humanity. Research has to be scientifically valid. So the studies that need to be done have to be things that would give us value, have to give us you know, direct results, direct value for what we're doing. 
There's integrity in research. There has to be an individual responsibility. As a research physician, I need to make sure we design our trial to make sure it works as well as possible, that we do the best we can. Uh, later today, Dr. Peter Marinkovich is going to talk about our gene transfer trial. We have had 15 amendments in that trial. So over the last five years, we have made 15 different changes. Each is a little tweaking to try to make it better, make it safer, make it easier, make it work so we get results that have value and have value for society and individual subjects. Institutional responsibility, Stanford, National Institute of Health, uh, FDA, uh, all institutions have responsibility that have standards of excellence. We need to have trustworthiness and lawfulness, and there are a lot of laws involved in this whole process. There has to be intellectual uh, honesty in proposing and performing research. There has to be accurate, accuracy in representing what the proposal is and who's contributing. There has to be fairness in peer review. If I'm doing a project, uh, one of the ways that we get our information out in society is by peer review. And if I have someone else that's trying to do something sim similar and I'm asked to review their publications and I have a bias and I try to stop them from moving forward, that's not fairness in review. You need to recognize the benefit of other people. Collegiality and scientific interactions. The collegiality of this meeting is very important. You as a community are coming together to help children, adults with a very severe condition. And as a village, as a team, it makes it much easier for families. We learn from each other, we work from each other. Scientific community has to do the same thing. Uh, in an EB, that is really happening internationally. Uh, the teams are working together, the European teams are, uh, and, and Asian teams are aware of the things we're doing and we try to share our information because we want the benefit of the individual patients. Enormous power over uh, research uh, subjects, the physician. As a physician in a clinical trial, I know a lot about the patient already. I read their medical records. I know a lot about the disease. I know a lot about the pain and suffering, but I don't feel the pain and suffering. And so there's enormous power that the physician has over individual patients. And the patients must trust that the physician is responsible and truly concerned for their well-being. And there's things that can get in the way with that. There are things that don't work. There's a conflict of interest uh, when the physician has greater knowledge. So there's the, the physician is, or the research person is in a place of power. Uh, and the problem is that, that that place of power can be corrupted. And one thing you really need to do is avoid financial conflict of interest. There may be conflict of interest from your institution generating revenue off your trial. There may be other conflicts of interest. The physician cannot have income coming from the company that's sponsoring the, the trial. Uh, there's different levels of that. At Stanford, uh, we have a conflict of interest committee that if we see any conflict of interest in any research trial, we get involved uh, and we, we evaluate and we say some people, you can't do that. You have to find somebody else to do it. And, and there are ways that we try to make sure that there's no financial conflict of interest. The patient, they have pain and suffering. They may sense personal coercion. What got me interested in the ethics of this is when a family came to me and said, doctor, you have to do something for my daughter. She's dying, you need to uh, do research on her to give her hope. Well, the idea is the research is to give hope, but it's to give hope for the community. Uh, and to enroll someone in, and to have someone be coerced to go into a trial is exactly what you don't want to do. And there's expectations from the subjects in trials that they're going to have benefits and not suffer consequences. And again, the theme I'm trying to show is you've got to look at the benefits, but you've got to be realistic that there may be consequences. So again, research is by definition not done to benefit the individual subject, but society as whole. But there's no reason we can't benefit the subject, but that's not the focus of the research. So what's happened? Many cases uh, in, in early last century uh, where horrible research was done to people without their consent. And so after the Second World War, there was a big movement on what do we do? How do we advance research? And basically the foundation of research in the United States is based upon what's called the Belmont Report, uh, which was written in 1978 and sort of came into law in 1979. And that is broken into three units. 
And I'd like to walk through each one because this is really the foundations of how we do research in the United States. One is respect for persons, beneficence, and justice. Respect for persons. This principle acknowledges the dignity and freedom of every person. It requires obtaining informed consent uh, from all potential research subjects or their legally authorized representative. Example, if it's your child, you're the re legally authorized, authorized representative. Uh, just last month, the FDA came out with a new advisement about conformed consent. I'd like to walk through the elements that they have in that. Uh, so one, an informed consent document that you would review when you go into a clinical trial, and it's not like a warranty you sign, click off the box to get on a web page, like to have access to a web page. This is a document you really need to read. You need to go over the informed consent because it has to be accurate and you have to understand it. Description of the clinical investigation. What are the doctors trying to figure out? What are they doing? Why are they doing it? How does it affect me? What are the risks and discomforts that I may have? Do I need to have more blood tests? Do I have more skin biopsies? Do I have to answer the phone? Do I have to drive to your office more often? What are the benefits? Uh, most of the consent forms will say you may not experience any benefits from this trial. And that's very important to realize that you may not have any benefits. You may have pain and consequences. You may have other side effects, but you may not have benefits. What are the other choices? For EB, there aren't a lot of other choices today. Uh, we talk about different wound dressings. We talk about different ways to, to give care. Uh, 50 years ago was the first major advancement in EB care, and that was Dr. Nancy Esterly, who's uh, one of the founders of the Society for Pediatric Dermatology, when she realized that breaking the blister early may limit the impact and severity of the disease. So you parents who take care of children with EB, that was 50 years ago that that was identified, and so that was one of the major breakthroughs in care uh, in EB that we know of. Uh, what, a, what about confidentiality? Confidentiality is very interesting in that uh, when we enroll someone in a trial, we, when we send data into our lab, we send data coded by a, a number so the people in the lab don't know whose cells they're working with, whose blood they're working with. Uh, and there's confidentiality in our medical records that we don't share our medical records with others. These are all parts of the confidentiality. But there's a new type of confidentiality that's starting to develop in clinical trials, and that's because you have networks of people. Uh, so when people are involved in a clinical trial, you may be talking to other people in the clinical trial, and there's a problem that you may somehow bias the opinion of others. In other words, uh, in a clinical research trial, the physician, the person in the trial, the team involved in that wants to know how that drug or how that product affects you. If it turns out you're affected by some other family that's also in a trial at another institution through Facebook or some other way, that can have a bias. Example would be, let's say you thought a given cream was causing your child's hair to turn blue. Well, now you let all the other families know in the trial, they may think that's true too, and it may turn out it's not true for anybody. Uh, but because that's sort of the idea, uh, an example would be another uh, drug that we've done a trial on for children with lymphatic malformations. That drug causes children to spit up more because it weakens the sphincter that holds the food in the stomach. And if families would, had, had not realized it was causing them to spit up, if one group of families said, nah, it doesn't make any difference and it, it biased the people's opinion, we wouldn't have picked up that change. We wouldn't know those difference. So it's important in a trial that you work with the investigator Realize there's a community of other people in the trial, but it's your impact with the medication that makes the difference and not necessarily the whole community. It's, it's individual for you, benefit for the community. Compensation, injury, uh, many trials, if, if you had an injury, the, there's a chance that the, the medication may cause a severe reaction that no one's ever seen of, no one's ever thought of. Uh, who's going to pay for that? That should be the informed consent documents. Contacts, what if you have a problem? Who are your doctors? Who are the people you're working with? What if you think this doctor or this team is forcing you into a trial? What do you do about it? Who do you call? All, that things, all those things should be in there. And voluntary participation. You want to be voluntary, there can't be compulsion. What about unforeseeable risk? These are other things that they'd like to have. We don't know. You'll see a statement that we don't know the unforeseeable risks. That's why we're doing the research. What if you decide you want to quit? Make sure that you, know, you can quit whenever. Uh, in our gene transfer trial, 
Once we graft a patient, it's going to be very difficult to remove those cells from the patient. And so that's in our consent form, that if for some reason you want these cells removed, there's probably not much of a chance that we can do that. Uh, so all the things, you know, that happen are important. Additional costs, costs may be time, may be effort. Uh, consequences, if you decide to withdraw, what happens? Uh, in our gene transfer trial, we're supposed to follow the patients for their life. Uh, FDA has strong, strict requirements for the first five years, but uh, or first 15 years. But it's very clear in our consent form that if you want to withdraw, you withdraw. But we're still going to call you every year to ask you how you're doing. You don't have to talk to us, but that's going to be our responsibility. That's what the FDA requires us to do, even if you withdraw. And we would hope that if you do withdraw, you'll still talk to us, because we, we need your information. Uh, new findings, so if we're doing a trial and you're in a trial and we find some new finding in another patient, it's our responsibility to let you know. This is something else we need to watch for. This is another benefit. This is another consequence. So those are very important things. How many people are doing this? How many people across the country? Sometimes you know that as well as we do because of, of uh, Facebook and the other contacts. And then documentation of informed consent. Usually in the United States, it's a written informed consent. So. In conformed consent is disclosure, what's going to happen to you, what's the risk, understanding, we need to make sure you understand it, voluntary authorization, you volunteer to do this, and uh, one investigation may limit another. So realize if you're in one trial, you may not be able to be in another trial. So one of the things you do may limit your ability to be in another trial. So these are very important things as you make your decision. So respect for persons, uh, children are consider considered vulnerable. Uh, just like prisoners, uh, just like disabled individuals, and we used to say just like medical students. Early in uh, research, medical students were always the subjects. They just, you know, you go to medical school, you're going to be a subject in research trial, you had no choice. Uh, now it's, it's more children, prisoners, and disabled people because uh, it's, it's difficult for them to say no. It's, it's hard to say no when, when you have a condition. Um, we, we presume that children would consent if they could, and so that in the United States, the parents have the ability to consent for the child. We presume that the proxy consent, that is the parents' consent uh, for the intervention, will not violate the respect for persons. Uh, some ethicists feel that there's no way that children should be in any trials uh, because they can't consent. But in the United States, by law and by our practice, we assume the parents can consent for the child. There is another aspect for the child in California and most states uh, by the federal regulations is assent. Uh, children between the ages of 7 and 18 are able to assent to a trial. And so if, let's say, we wanted to do a survey of itching in children with EB, um, we would have the child between the ages of 7 and, and, and up to age 18 sign an assent that they agree to be involved. It's a very simple form. It says, says something like, will I be hurt in this trial? What if I don't want to be in this trial? Uh, who do I talk to? Your parents, basically. Your, 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 uh, and it's a very simple, but you agree to be involved. Uh, most children with cancer in the United States are involved in a clinical trial. It's not their choice. Uh, and so there's a waiver of assent. There's no assent for those. The parents sign. And in the clinical trials for cancer are currently, we may know that these three drugs seem to be the best, but maybe by adding drug four, it may be a little better, or maybe by changing the dose of drug two, it may make it a little better. So these are the kind of trials that are going on, and that's not something a child can decide. That's something a parent can decide because they're trying to compare the effectiveness and find the best therapy. So assent's another important part. Research not involving, in the, and so federal regulations uh, Nash, uh, FDA regulations are very structured in the way that they do this. So if a, if a research not involves greater than minimal risk, children can participate. Uh, and that's where the ascent would be involved also. So example would be minimal risk for a child would be riding their bicycle, uh, walking across the street. Uh, research involving greater than minimal risk, uh, but presenting the prospect of direct benefit to the individual, that's where children could participate. Uh, so example would be the Cyoderm study. That's been presented. That's children in that. There's a, there's a chance that the medication may help the children and the, and the risk is minimal. As we get more complicated, research involving greater than minimal risk with no prospect of direct benefit individual subjects. So that currently would be what happens in our gene transfer trial. 
So the FDA requires that only adults who can consent would be involved in that. So children cannot be involved in trials where there's greater than minimal risk and, and no prospect of direct benefit unless there's some other way, some other value. And then it gets really complicated when, when you don't expect the child to receive any benefit from a trial, uh, and, but it could alleviate serious problems for other individuals. So these get to be very complex considerations, but normally it's, it's the child has, has minimal risk if they're involved in a trial. Minimal risk might include drawing blood tests. Um, there's a, th a process that happens in children in research which is interesting in that their studies have documented that a parent may be more likely to enroll their child into a study than they themselves would enroll into that study. So one of the things we as parents are very protective of our children, we, but again, when you have care for a child with EB, you see their pain and suffering every day. And you really have a desire to try to do something as quickly and as rapidly and as best you can. So we as parents may often enroll our children into trials, and that's not true just for EB, that's true for all diseases in children. Uh, and it's, it's part of, I think, our maternal or paternal instincts that we do. We want the best. Consent form must clearly define the risk and dangers. Uh, respect for subjects, so manage information to protect pri privacy, allow withdrawal, inform of new information, carefully monitor participation, and mechanism to uh, inform participants of what we've learned. These are all processes uh, that I needed to repeat because it's important that we know all these things. Beneficence. This principle requires the maximum benefit and minimum harm uh, for any, anybody in a research project. So this is where we're trying to protect you. Research-related risks must be reasonable in light of expected ben benefits. If you're given a drug that has severe side effects for a minor condition, you're not gonna be allowed to do that research process, even in adults. So it, it's gotta be that if you have a severe condition, we'll try some drugs that may have higher risk. You have to have a comprehensive discussion of all alternatives. So why would you want to enter this trial if this drug has little chance of helping you but a high chance of giving you severe side effects? That has to be information you know. Medicine as a pr profession has generally accepted duty to advance scientific knowledge in pursuing new therapies, and this justifies some overriding short utility. So if you have a severe disease and we have a medicine that maybe has one out of a thousand chance of a severe consequences, and you're informed of that, and there's a chance this medicine may really help you, then you may be willing to take that one out of a thousand chance. And so these are decisions you need to make. There's another thing that the federal government has is called the common rule. Uh, this is related to risk. Uh, they, must be relay, uh, they must be reasonable in relation to the benefits. Uh, it's important that you know the risk, it's important that you know what you're hopeful to have, but these things are very important. The risk and the benefit ratio has to be great. If you have great risk and minimal benefit, you're not gonna be able to do that study. There's terms called th uh, th uh, <clears throat> therapeutic misconceptions, and this is very common in research studies. Overestimating the benefit, underestimating the risk. So the consent form may have that, it may not. We, we try to eliminate that in the consent forms. But as parents, this is often our situation. We'll look at the good things, we'll avoid the bad things. Research, again, is not individual benefit. Like an example, we have a gene transfer trial. Our goal is to be able to take a gene, genetically correct people's cells and give them back. If that happens, that's called gene therapy. But if I told you gene therapy, you're gonna think much more positively about that than if I told you gene transfer. We have to use the term gene transfer in all of our documents. We don't know it's a therapy yet. Treat or treatment. I'd like to give you this medicine to treat your disease. That sounds like great, it's gonna help me. The fact is, I don't know if this medicine's gonna help. So I'd like to give you this medicine as a treatment for this disease, not to treat. So these are minor things, but they're very important. If I suggest treatment, I'm suggesting benefit. I'm sorry, if I suggest treat, I'm suggesting benefit. If I suggest treatment, I'm saying, well, maybe, maybe we will have some benefit. And patients are subjects. I tell our patients, we work with different teams of doctors. I'm the I tell them I'm the mad scientist. So to you, you are a subject. 
Uh, we have other doctors who are the EB physicians who care for the patients, and they're there looking for your welfare. We also have ethicists who are advocates for our patients in some of our complicated studies. So subjects in research different than patients, different, different relationship. Therapeutic misconception of benefit. Desperate patients want to hear what they want to hear. A lot of studies showing you hear what you think you want, you don't read the rest, you don't understand the rest. Subjects cannot understand most of the information they'll be given. We have really tried to make the informed consent process much simpler, lower level of language, less complexity, but still, it can be very difficult to understand. Uh, I thought Ellen Fender, talking about genetics, tried to make things simple and easy, but I'm sure that some of the things she said, you know, it, it's difficult to, to understand. Some information they are being given may be misleading anyway, and sometimes the way the information is presented, it may be misleading. Uh, subjects are often confused about the nature, the goals, and the activity of the research process. And so there's processes to try to correct that. Uh, justice, this requires that equitable selection, recruitment, and fair treatment of research subjects. Uh, for our gene transfer trial, we have to open it up to the United States. We have to pay the expenses of people to come travel because that's the only fair way to do it. If we just did it in California, that wouldn't be fair. That wouldn't be the way to do it. So basically, three pillars of research, informed consent, independent review, and integrity of the researchers. So what some people feel is that the integrity of the uh, responsible investigator is more important than informed consent form, but it's really all together. So what happens? So with the development of the Belmont principles, these three principles, uh, the Belmont Report, we've developed in the United States what's called an Institutional Review Board, or IRB. And so the IRB is the Administrative Panel on Human Research, which reviews all university projects. So any university, any academic medical center in the United States, or any university that's doing research, it doesn't have to be a medical center, they have to have access to an IRB, an Institutional Review Board, uh, and they oversight on what's happening. IRB are looking at the risk, all the things we talked about. This is the committee that oversees to make sure that uh, subjects are, are, the risk and benefits are, are fair. Participant selection is equitable. They're not selecting one racial group, one gender. Uh, privacy and confidentiality are protected. Uh, participants are adequately informed of their participation. And that inform, includes a, uh, a informed consent and the plan for monitoring, that the science is accurate. So each institution has their own IRB, and it turns out the IRB is king at that institution, king or queen. Uh, if they say, no, you can't do this research, you can't do this research. You are not required to have an IRB approval in community practice. So if I was a physician in private practice and I decided I wanted to do a research study, uh, I don't have to have an IRB. And an academic medical center, I would get fired if I didn't do, if I tried to do any research project without having an IRB involvement, I'd get fired at Stanford very quickly. It would, would be no question about it. Uh, and so there is a little difference there. Most practitioners don't do research, and if they do do research, they'll often get an IRB. There's other IRBs you can use. But one thing that's happened to try to enforce this idea is if you want to publish your article in a good journal, uh, the journals require that you have IRB approval. So there's different uh, checks and balances that occur. So one of the goals of medical care is to cure when possible, to comfort always. Uh, what will be the future goals of, of cost-effective care? So, and this affects what we're doing with EB. And so I thought I'd give you sort of a broad idea of what happens in the area of orphan diseases, um, because EB is one of those orphan diseases and this is an area of hope, of what's, what's going to happen in the future. So in the U.S., the United States, an orphan disease is less, uh, less than 200,000 people that are affected. So that's about 7 out of 10,000. Uh, in Europe, it's, a, it's, it's 1 in uh, 2,000. Uh, so 5 out of 1,000 people. So it's a little smaller group. So the National Organization for Rare Disorders, of which I think uh, uh, most of the EB communities are involved with, uh, provides patient-friendly language for about 1,200 uh, rare diseases. Then there's a European group. And this NORD was very active in developing uh, the orphan disease statutes that will help us and help our children. So 6 to 8 percent of the population is affected by one rare disease. So many of us in this room have a rare disease 
that others may not be aware of. 30% of children with rare diseases die before reaching their fifth birthday. So these may be severe neurological diseases. They can be gastrointestinal, different, different. Um, by odds, all of us in here carry six to eight genetic mutation abnormalities. Uh, you heard Ellen Fender say that our odds are about one in 350 that we carry, uh, in, not in this room, but in a normal population, the odds are about one in 350 that we carry a, 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 a genetic malformation for EB. And 80 percent of rare diseases have been identified with genetic origins. Eventually that number is going to go closer to 99 percent as we get more effective genetic analysis. Common characteristics of rare disease, they're usually severe, they're chronic, they're degenerative, they're life-threatening, onset in childhood, incurable, difficult to manage, and severe psychological despair. Uh, I think we're talking about EB very clearly. Living with an orphan disease, uh, one thing that, that we have is a lack of uh, correct diagnosis, lack of information, and lack of scientific knowledge. And that's why these type of meetings are so important where you can gain more knowledge, where you can, you can have uh, more information, you can meet other families, we learn from other families, um, the high cost of health care and drugs, and inequality and available of treatment and care. Uh, if you have EB in a third world country, uh, we are constantly receiving emails from families in third world countries who have very little hope. Um, there are some communities that have a lot of inbreeding where I'm aware of one community in the Middle East where about one out of 100 children are born with severe lethal junctional EB. Uh, and that's because you, you usually marry your cousin or a relative or your niece. And with that kind of inbreeding, you're going to have a rare disease that's going to express itself continuously. So what happens with a delay in diagnosis? More children with the same disease, you have a child with EB, you don't realize it's genetic, uh, you, you may have more. Uh, one of the big problems is loss of confidence in healthcare, and I'm sure you've all experienced that. Um, that's why we've tried to develop EB centers in the United States, places that have, and also the world, uh, Europe has centers, Asia's having centers now, to try to go someplace where they have a better knowledge of your disease, you can gain more insight. Uh, the Deborah Nurse is an example of, of a healthcare environment that can be, really be very helpful for you. All these things are important. And then with, the, with the, these rare diseases, where do I find support? And I think this community is where you find support for EB. So orphan drugs, so you have the orphan diseases, and now we get into orphan drugs, and this is where it's important for us. Orphan drugs are, 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 are medications, products prevent, intended for the diagnosis, uh, prevention, or treatment of rare diseases. So the SNOR, the National Organization of Rare Diseases, got President Reagan to sign a law in 1983. And so often when a drug is, is developed, it's patented, and sometimes the patent expires before people even get to use the drug. So the companies lose their financial reason to do it. But if it turns out if you have a drug, uh, once it once it's, uh, becomes approved by the FDA, if it's a, for a rare disease, you have seven additional years of patent on it. So this can be a financial benefit for companies developing drugs. And this is why many companies are starting to look at EB uh, and other orphan diseases, and that's why I think there's a lot of more hope for the future. Uh, tra tax credits, uh, research and development grants, all these things are being done for orphan disease. What's called fast track approval, uh, FDA will give extra time, extra effort to try to help you uh, do that. On our gene transfer trial, the FDA has said very clearly, uh, that after we have our initial five subjects, they want to help us design the next part of the trial so we can try to move as rapidly as possible. Um, there are fees when a company applies to the FDA to have a new drug. Uh, there's waiver of those fees with an orphan drug, and that can be hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, parent support groups, uh, DEBRA, many of these other groups, EBMRF, Jackson Silver Foundation, these parent support groups have come as a result of this orphan disease legislation, and then they also bring subjects or patients with them that can be involved in the research trial. Uh, support groups are very helpful for recruiting, and so those are very important. I heard that there's a study that's being recruited here now. I think that's excellent. So FDA has granted about 3,000 orphan designations, different drugs, EB is one of those. Uh, development and marketing for more than 400 drugs, 
has happened so far, but the disappointing information is that most of these have been in the rare lysosomal storage diseases, and most of them have been in cancer oncology. You know, we think of cancer as being a, a broad disease affecting more than 200,000 people in the United States, but what happens if you separate it to like a, 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 a acute lymphocytic leukemia, that's a separate orphan disease, then it's not cancer as a, as a group, it's cancer, each of these individual diseases. So many of the new medications that are developed for cancer are taking advantage of the orphan drug statutes. So FDA provides grants for clinical studies. Um, they support the clinical development of products. So usually you think of the FDA as being regulatory. It turns out uh, they have an entitlement or a, a, where they are assigned money to be used for orphan disease. So they have grants uh, where no th current therapy exists, but where a product development may help in that disease. So this is specific funding for orphan diseases. That's about $10 million a year. What's the future? Well, there's some concern that, that should we even be focused on orphan diseases? Should we, should we focus on the diseases that occur in the large population and not just on orphan diseases? So people talk about what's the cost-benefit ratio? Why should we help patients with EB because that's so rare? Uh, but it turns out that in the scientific community, uh, the knowledge that we've gained about how the skin functions a lot of that knowledge has come from scientific study focused on epidermolysis bullosa. How these different molecules cause blisters also are very important and how these different molecules work in normal skin. Uh, so a lot of research that's, that's focused on skin biology has a large relationship to EB. And so national health care burden, we feel that, that focusing on these rare diseases is extremely important that there's a lot of knowledge that would be gained to help the general population and not just the specific patients. Industry rewards for commercial risk, definitely the Orphan Drug uh, Act has helped that. Cost effectiveness, you know, is, is the cost benefit. If we have a new way to help EB, example would be wound healing. If we can help, help heal the wounds of children and adults with EB, we might be able to heal the wounds of diabetic ulcers and other things. So there's a lot of benefit to working with orphan diseases. So not just show improvements, but measure endpoints and demonstrate achievements to therapy and by predetermined targets. That's the future. So do the risk outweigh possible rewards? Absolutely. The rewards for the community can be fantastic. What about the individual subject? Well, the individual subject needs to go into the research trial realizing that you may be facing the risk and you may have a possible reward, but the risks are very important. In the early phases of research trials, the risk can have a major impact on what you do, uh, where in the community later, they will know what the risks are and there may be ways to avoid that. So definitely, I think that the risk outweigh the possible rewards, absolutely, for the community. But when you go into a trial, make sure you read that informed consent. Make sure you understand it. In our gene transfer trial, our informed consent is 27 pages. And when we get ready to enroll a subject, we mail them a paper copy of that so they have a chance to read it. And what we do is we mail it on blue paper because we know we're gonna throw blue paper away. And, and the patients are so anxious to be involved that they often will sign that blue paper. They may even have a notary public sign it and, and it's, it doesn't work. It's, it, it, the system doesn't work. I have to present this information to you you have to sign in our presence, we sign it together. So, but, but understanding, we, although we tell the people, don't sign it. Uh, so many of them won't get it signed without really reading it. Uh, it takes me about an hour, an hour and a half to go through our informed consent with patients with EB. Uh, I make sure that they have something to drink, some water, realize they're gonna be there for a while uh, because they really need to understand that informed consent. So know your risk, know there's a possibility of rewards, but also a lot of the rewards may be for the community in the future. I'd be happy to answer any questions. This is my last slide. Yes.
Yeah, so let me, let me rep I don't know if you all in the back heard the question. So the question is that parents are overwhelmed with EV, and, and I think that's very true. Yes, so the question. See, the idea would be is, is there an advocate that could help parents? Well, in some situations, the study is very simple and very straightforward. It's not complex, and you don't need to have an adequate advocate. In our gene transfer trial, we were the first to suggest this that we're aware of to the FDA and to the NIH, that we were going to have a bioethicist as an advocate for the subject. And the agreement we have with the bioethicist is she cannot publish anything related to what we're doing. She has no benefit to be involved in the study. We pay part of her salary for her time and effort. But there's what you normally think in academics is publication and, and education. That's not an advantage to her. Her advantage is just that she knows bioethics and she is an advocate for the patient. But not all studies are that complex to require that. But the idea in some of the studies, you know, as it gets more complex, as we're talking about some of these other therapies and bone marrow transplant and stuff like that, I think to have an advocate for the patient would be extremely important because these are extremely complex. We're going to be um, receiving your questions so that we can get them to our speakers and then we will be able to share that with the whole community. So if you could write it down on a piece of paper and give it to me, I'll be happy to get it in the right hands and then get it out to our community. Let me answer. Someone asked my email. Uh, sure. It's easy. Al.lane at stanford.edu. Thank you so much, Dr. Lane.